Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today is a super, super exciting night because this is the first light I'll be able to get in with this new observatory system which I've been working on for the last couple months. And this is my Southern Hemisphere Observatory system. And I'm gonna give you guys a whole walkthrough of all of the equipments I chose, why I chose it, and uh, give you some thoughts that you might need to consider for your own remote observatory. But yeah, so the plan started about seven months ago when I decided I wanted to have an observatory in the Southern Hemisphere and that I was ready to finally make the jump to do it. I ended up finding a place in Namibia that was pretty affordable and I decided I would, you know, go ahead and build the system and send it out. So I've taken some parts that I already owned along with some new parts and created this system to do all sorts of astrophotography from the southern hemisphere and kind of keep myself a bit versatile in the things that I do and the options that I have. So without further ado, let's go from the ground up on this setup. At the bottom, I've got an Ioptron CEM70. Now this isn't a typical remote observatory mount as you may be familiar with them. It's not, you know, a premium mount. It's not a 10 micron, a plane wave or a software bisque but it's the one I had. So I actually already own this mount. This is my replacement mount for my Paramount Mighty, which is at its own remote observatory. And I've decided that this should be capable enough to use for a remote observing telescope. Now, the reason I say that is because one, it has a pretty large payload capacity of 70 pounds. And two is because it has the most critical thing for remote mounts is that it has a physical home position, which means basically if the power goes off, I can tell the mount to home itself and it's going to return to this North Park position where it's supposed to go and it's going to know that it, that's where it's supposed to be located. So there's no risk of a, a peer collision or anything like that. So this is the feature that premium mounts usually have that make them possible to use remotely like the Paramount Mighty, the ME2, the MX Plus all have this physical home. There are mounts with absolute encoders like the 10 micron and the plane wave that always know where they are, even in the event of a power outage. But this having the manual physical home lets me use this cheaper mount as a remote observatory mount. So that's what I'm going to be doing with this. Now, I haven't really used it for deep sky imaging, surprisingly. <laughs> I've been using this mount mostly for uh, lunar, solar, that type of stuff back when I lived in Utah, but now it's a bit too big and heavy for me and it's just you know the perfect size and the perfect weight capacity for what i need now which is to hold this stuff so this at the top here along with this rat nest of cables is the optical system for this observatory as well as the computer so starting with the main telescope this is a takahashi fsq 85 and i have a 1.0 1x field flattener on the back so that I can use it with a full frame camera, which is the ZWO 6200mm on the back. I have a two inch filter wheel here loaded with Antlia filters, three nanometer for narrowband, and I have a ZWO OAG with a QHY5 off axis guide camera. And those are thrown together with, with a bunch of adapters all the way to this Asado three inch focuser, then bolted directly to the FSQ85. So this is going to give me about 450 millimeters of focal length, which is a fair amount of reach to hit a lot of the big southern hemisphere targets, which is the idea of this system. Now this telescope isn't mine, this actually belongs to Starpunker, and we are working together to help create this observatory, and this telescope was his contribution. I kind of gutted it and I replaced the focuser, I replaced the reducer that it came with, and he also contributed this 6200 camera, and then I got a filter wheel, filters, OAG, and a guide camera for it. Now the reason I went with this is because I just wanted an easy to use telescope that wasn't going to be too much difficulty with long focal length. Just a telescope to help get my feet wet to this observatory that I'm taking a huge risk on. And this is a, a very nice general purpose astrograph as well. You know, it supports full frame with the full frame camera which will be really great. Uh, my plan, hopefully, is to do a lot of mosaics like I have been doing with my Northern Hemisphere Observatory, and this will kind of be like the Southern Hemisphere twin to that system. So this is just gonna be a good astrograph, good general, you know, basic refractor. You can't go wrong with, a, with an 80 mil, and I'm hoping this one will be quite good. I haven't taken any test images with it yet, but we'll see how it does, so. 
that is the telescope. Oh, and for choices on the, the focuser, I went with an Asado 3-inch focuser purely because I thought they were pretty good. I've set up a number of remote observatories that use these, and they seem to be pretty good build quality, and I didn't want to spend all the money on another Nightcrawler focuser or wait the eight weeks to get one produced. So this is just a good option for me. You may be wondering why I don't have a rotator in my system. And the reason being is that it's not really super essential most of the time. A rotator only really matters if you're super up close and you're looking for guide stars and an OAG for a long focal length system. And that's not really what this telescope does. I should always have a guide star pretty much with this guiding setup. So there's no concern about rotation. And if I wanted to get better framing on something, I would just shoot a mosaic, which is what I'm planning on doing anyways. So the rotator is really just an accessory. It would be nice for doing mosaics closer to the Southern Hemisphere pole, because as you know, the mosaic panels actually rotate relative to each other when you're close to the Northern pole or the Southern pole, but I'm just gonna suck it up and live with it. And it should be good enough. So down at the back end of the telescope, again, there is the camera, the filter wheel, and the guiding system. And I wanted to talk a bit more about my guiding system and how it ties in to the other part of my system. So I've chosen to use an OAG for this setup. And you may be wondering, it's just a short focal length refractor. Why do you need an OAG? What's the point of that? So the reason I went with an OAG is because I'm using this thing up here, which is a 135 millimeter camera lens system. And this is going to be shooting wide field. And I'll tell you more about that later, but bringing that back is why I chose to use an OAG on this system because I don't really have a place to mount a mini guide scope. I could stack a mini guide scope on top of my already tall system, but that wouldn't be very stable and that wouldn't give me very good guiding. I would have a ton of differential flexure and that's not what I wanted to do. So I wanted a guide system that had no flexure that I could use to auto guide both the main refractor and the wide field system. So the OAG was the obvious choice just to be able to fit everything together in a simple package. So as far as the guide camera, I have a QHY5 too right now. I might change that out for a 174, but this is what was in stock. So this is the one I got, but I might switch it out. Now with this framing, you can get a better idea of what I mean when I say there really isn't any space to fit a guide scope on this setup. I have this 3D printed lens bracket here and if I were to put a guide scope on this, that's just way too much for differential flexure. So that being said, let me tell you about the second optical part of this observatory system, and that is the 135 millimeter camera lens setup. Now, I've got a Prima Luce clamp, a small little radiant dovetail, I have an Astrodimium 3D printed ring system, and then inside of this is the Rockinon 135 F2 lens and I have a ZWO EAF with a belt focuser to be able to do remote autofocusing. And on the back, I have a ZWO 6200 MC to do color wide field imaging. Now the goal with this little system is to be able to do large wide field Milky Way mosaics. Where this telescope is going to be, the Milky Way core goes directly overhead. So I wanna be able to take full advantage of that and do beautiful all sky images with huge resolution mosaics and this is what is going to accomplish that. Now the Rockinon 135 is a super cheap lens. It's like $500 manual focus, but it is optically exceptional. Even with this full frame camera, I have this tip tilt adjusted and it just produces beautiful images, full frame, corner to corner. I might stop it down to F2.2, but it's really an amazing system. Now for the camera choice, the reason I went with a one shot color camera like this one is because I'm doing color mosaics. Now the problem is when you're doing monochrome color mosaics, it's quite difficult to do them and not get really bad gradients. The problem is as conditions change while you cycle through filters each night, you won't be able to blend your panels together as well for a mosaic. So with color mosaics in mind, I chose to eat some of my real resolution and sacrifice it for better gradients with a color camera instead. Now this is going to let me get, you know, big views of the Milky Way and big mosaics with cleaner images, less gradients. And that is the main hope. I do have a filter drawer here. I might switch it out for a, uh, a narrow band filter at some point. Maybe a dual band filter would be absolutely awesome to have at some point. But we will think about that in the future. For now, this is the wide field rig. Now, the one question is, do I plan to run these in tandem? And the answer is maybe. 
I might use this to shoot while this one is going, but in the real world, I won't probably be running these in tandem all the time because of the dithering thing. I know I could use Nina to synchronize dither, but depending on what object I shoot, it might not be so practical, you know? And the other thing is, I'll probably only be using this on the new moons because again, it's a one-shot color camera. This is intended for more new moon shooting and this system with narrowband filters, because I have a set of Antlia narrowband filters, will let me shoot while the moon is out. So I'll have something to do for new moon, something to do for full moon, and using these in tandem will let me stay versatile in both conditions. Originally, I was just planning to send out this, just a 135 millimeter lens. And then I decided, you know what? I need something to do while the moon is out. I need something with narrowband filters. So in comes the telescope to fill that void. And that is the complete optical package for this observatory system. Now for computers, what I'm planning on using is a Prima Luce Eagle 4 Pro. And my reason for using this computer here is a bit interesting. So there are some interesting reasons, but the Eagle itself is just a good system. I have installed probably about five Eagles on remote observatories, and I've used many of them. And they all work very well and very consistently, and it's just a good buy it and forget it purchase for remote observatories. So this is basically just what I use consistently. Uh, you could get your own Intel Nuke and just use it yourself. There are some interesting problems when it comes to powering your stuff. Because the Eagle on the back here has these four remote switchable power ports. As you can see here, these power ports let you power on and off devices super duper easily. And that was one of the main reasons why I needed this system. And that's because in Namibia, they don't use 120 volts, 60 hertz power. They use 230 volts, 50 hertz power. And that means I can't just get a power strip here and send it out there and plug all my stuff in. I need to be able to power all my stuff with the right voltage. So the power supply for this computer can run off of the EU Shuko plug, the 230 volts, 50 hertz AC plug, and I can use that to power all of my 12 volt devices through this very simply. So it was just a no-brainer way to get power to literally everything in my setup and not have to deal with, you know, voltage transformers or other things. It was just a super, super simple route. So that's why we went with the Eagle. Uh, it has like 500 gigabytes of space on it, but I have an SSD I'm sending out with it. So I'll have an extra two terabytes on the system, which I'm gonna need with these, you know, double cameras. But the Eagle is just a super awesome package, super easy to set up and use. And I didn't want to stray away from the path on this observatory. So it's what I went with for this one. So that is the, the brains of the whole system, the optics and the mount. Now, I'm going to wait until dark, and we're hopefully going to get a nice first light test image with this whole system. I'm not going to be going crazy. I'm not going to be doing 30 hours or so. We're just going to do a one night test image, see what we get, how our stars look, and see how well the system performs in this first fully powered test of it. All right, guys, it's been a bit of a literal nightmare getting this thing going, but uh, <laughs> I was having a ton of problems getting the Eagle to connect, so I had to bring out a, a monitor and a mouse to actually run my stuff because the Eagle would just keep dropping connection, which was super frustrating, but it's running fine now. I've got it pointed at M42, and I'm just getting my guiding focus and everything. I had a bunch of problems with getting the camera to focus. I had to switch out some adapters, which you all know how difficult that can be, that can be to pry out a, a really stuck adapter. So I got that fixed, but I think I'm going to need to order a new one because I'm pretty close to the end of my focus travels or my focus travel range. So I'm going to have to get a new part, but uh, we're at least in focus and we're auto guiding and we're just waiting for the Orion Nebula to rise a bit higher. I'm going to try and grab a quick little test shot. I haven't even started running the wide field rig yet. I already know it works because I've used it a bunch, but I think tonight we're just going to focus on this and see how she goes. But I'm going to run the camera now and I'll see you guys with an image soon.
So I've elected to do the horse head instead as a first light because it's above the trees a bit sooner. So <laughs> that's what we're going for. I'm doing an autofocus right now and then we're going to start rolling off some three minute long exposures. And it's looking like we might get a nice little test shot tonight. So I'm super excited that this has finally all come together. What started out as just a, a potential, an idea a couple months ago has materialized into a real telescope system. And I couldn't be happier to have it almost ready and done. Our first subframe is about to drop. Five, four, three, two, one. This is a HA exposure, three minutes. Let's see how we got, how, we, how, sorry, it's so cold out how it looks. It looks pretty juicy, y'all. It looks pretty good. I think I'm gonna like this telescope. Anyways, I'm cold. I'm gonna hide inside some more, but yeah, that's the new scope.